Over the next few lectures, we're going to learn a little bit more about dimension. To help us do this, we need some results about linear independence, which is what is going to be the subject of this video. The result we're going to prove, first of all, is called the extension lemma. What it says is that if you have elements v1 up to vn of a vector space which are linearly independent, and if you have an element u which is not in their span, then the sequence which you get by adding u onto the end of the v's is still linearly independent. So our proof of that is going to actually be a proof of the contrapositive statement. If you've forgotten what the contrapositive is, you should pause the video and look that up. But this is a statement that says, if p then q. In other words, p implies q. So the contrapositive is not p implies not q, and it's logically equivalent. So instead of proving this statement, we can simply prove the contrapositive instead. And that's what we'll do. So the contrapositive here is that if v1 then v2, then all the way up to vn, and then u is linearly dependent, LD for short, then u is in the span of v1 up to vn. So when we're proving this statement, what we should do is assume that v1 up to vn followed by u is linearly dependent. So if they're linearly dependent, then there are scalars l and l1 up to ln such that L times U plus L1 times V1 plus L2 times V2 up to Ln times Vn is equal to the zero vector of our vector space. Now it can't be that L was zero. Because if it was, then we'd have L1 V1 plus and so on up to L N V N equal to the zero vector with not all of the L i's equal to zero. And that's a contradiction to the V1, the vectors V1 up to Vn being linearly independent. So L must be non-zero. We're now just going to rearrange this equation to give us an expression for U. Since L is not zero, I can multiply everything by L to the minus one, and I can move all these vectors onto the other side. I can rearrange this. When I do that, I get U is equal to minus L to the minus one L one V one minus L to the minus one L two V two and so on. This thing here is visibly a linear combination of V one up to Vn. So it's an element of the span of V one up to Vn. That means we've proved that if v1, v2 up to vn followed by u was linearly dependent, then u was in the span of the v's, completing the proof of our result. So that's called the extension lemma. 
What we want the extension lemma for now is to prove the following result. That if V is a finite dimensional vector space, and if L1 up to Ln is a linearly independent sequence of elements of V, then there is a basis of V containing those elements L1 up to Ln. In other words, you can extend a linearly independent sequence to a basis of the vector space that that linearly independent sequence came from. So our proof is going to use the fact that V is finite dimensional. You'll remember that the definition of finite dimensional was that the vector space which is finite dimensional must contain a finite spanning set. So let's let V1 up to Vm be a spanning set. What we're going to do is to produce a sequence of sequences of elements of V, starting with the sequence L1 up to Ln, and adding in some of these elements of our spanning set. We're going to do this in such a way that at the end of this procedure, what we end up with is a linearly independent sequence whose span contains each one of the Vs which is therefore a spanning set for V and a basis for V. So let's do this. We define S0 to be the sequence L1 up to Ln. So this is a linearly independent sequence of vectors from V. Now for each i, from 1 up to m, we define, or 1 up to m minus 1, we define si plus 1 to be one of two possibilities. So we will define this to be just the same as what si was if vi plus 1 is in the span of s i and s i followed by v i plus 1. So I just mean take the sequence s i and add v i plus 1 onto the end of that sequence in the case that v i plus 1 is not in the span of s i. So let's notice something before we do anything else. Let's notice that in every case So in both of those two cases, vi plus 1 is in the span of si plus 1. Because if we were in the first case, well then si plus 1 was just the same as si, but because we're in the first case, vi plus 1 is in the span of si, and si is si plus 1. In the second case, then vi plus 1 was not in the span of si, but then si plus 1 has actually got vi plus 1 in it, so certainly it's in the span of si plus 1. Okay, that's a key observation. So why is that useful? Well, what it tells us is that all of the vectors v1, v2, up to vn are in the span of the last one of our the last one of our sequences, Sm. Uh, I've written n there, and of course I meant m. So the reason is because um, S0 is contained in S1, and S1 is contained in S2, and S2 is contained in S3, and so on. So since each Si plus 1 contains Vi plus 1 in its span, then when you get to the end, you get something whose span contains all of V1 up to Vm. But the Vi's formed a spanning set. So actually, span S m is v. 
right? The span of SM is a subspace. Subspaces are closed undertaking linear combinations, but every vector in V is a linear combination of V1 up to Vm, because we're assuming that V1 up to Vm is a spanning set. So the span of SM contains every vector in V, and therefore the span of SM equals V. That means SM is a spanning set. It's also linearly independent. In fact, every SI for i greater than or equal to 0 is linearly independent. The reason for that is S0 is the sequence L1 up to Ln, which we assumed to be linearly independent. And SI plus 1, well, either it's the same as SI, in which case, because SI was linearly independent, so is SI plus 1, or it's SI with a vector not in the span of SI added to the end, which is linearly independent by the extension lemma. So SM is a linearly independent spanning set which begins with L1 up to Ln, and therefore it is a basis. We're done. Let's now look at an example of this. The procedure can be a little bit hard to follow, so we're going to do an example just to illustrate this proof and to show that actually the proof is not just a proof, but an actual useful technique for producing bases containing a given set. So we're going to work in the vector space R cubed, and we're going to take the sequence, the linearly independent sequence L, just to have one element, L1, which is going to be 1, 2, and 3. And this is an element of the vector space R cubed. We're now going to extend this to a basis of R cubed containing L1. So the way our procedure worked was that we needed a spanning set for R cubed. So the spanning set we're going to use is the spanning set consisting of the standard basis 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 of R cubed. So the first step was, well, let's give these some names first, actually. So for consistency with the notation of my proof, I'll call that v1, and that v2, and that v3. So we're going to use this spanning set following the procedure in the proof to build a basis of R cube containing L1. Uh, we define S0 is going to be just the sequence with L1 in it. And then for S1, we have to work out whether v1 is in the span of L1 or not. So, in fact, it isn't. Uh, V1 is not in the span of S0. Right, the span of S0 just contains scalar multiples of L1. And no scalar multiple of L1 is equal to 1, 0, 0. Because if you wanted to have zeros in the second position, you'd have to multiply L1 by 0, and then you don't have a 1 at the top. So no scalar multiple of L1 is equal to V1, and therefore V1 is not in the span of S0. So we should take S1 to be the sequence L1 and then V1. Okay, so then we have to ask the question, is V2 in the span of S1? So um, 
this is not obvious, we need to work it out. So let's try and write V2 as a linear combination of the elements in the sequence S1. A times L1 plus B times L2 equals V2. So what does that say? Uh, A, 2A, 3A plus B times, oh, that shouldn't be an L, should it? Sorry, I've written the wrong thing there. This should be B times V1 equals L2. So we should have 0, B, 0, and this is supposed to be equal to, I've really written the wrong thing again. B times V1 is B0, 0, 0. That's better. This is supposed to be equal to V2, which is 0, 1, 0. Okay, so what have we got there? A plus B, 2A, 3A is equal to 0, 1, 0. And you can already see that this is impossible. The first, uh, the second row would require A equals a half. The second row, the third row requires A equals zero. So this is impossible. There are no solutions. You cannot write V2 as an element of the span of S1. So V2 is not in the span of S1. Right, that means we take S2 to be equal to L1, V1, V2, and we have to keep going. So we now ask, is V3 in the span of S2? Well, again, we can work this out by trying to solve the equations. So we'll try and work, find scalars A, B and C such that A L1 plus B V1 plus C V2 is equal to V3, which is 0, 0, 1. And the answer here is yes, you can find those scalars. What you've got on the left is A, 2A, 3A, A plus B in the first place, and then 2A plus C in the second place. And you want this to be equal to 0, 0, 1. But it's easy to solve this. So we have to have A is equal to a third from the last entry of the vector, then C is minus 2A, so minus 2 thirds, and B is minus A. So that solves um, this equation. Therefore, V3 is in the span of S2. So we don't add um, V3 to our sequence. So let me just squeeze this in in the corner. So S3 is going to be the same as S2. All right. Um, conclusion. We've, we stop because we've dealt with every single element of our spanning set. And what we get to conclude is that L1, then V1, then V2 is a basis of R cubed containing L. And we're done.